welcome to my podcast, Conversations with David. I'm your host, David Owasi. And on this podcast, we're talking to professionals and entrepreneurs across the country. We're learning about what keeps them passionate, what keeps them going. And we're also talking about lessons learned along the way. I'm here with my very good friend, Azrin, who I am super, super excited to bring on and ask some questions uh, to. Um, why don't you introduce yourself, Azrin? Sure. So my name is Azrin, as, as David has said. I live in Canada, a city called Calgary, which is really close to the Rocky Mountains. Mm-hmm. So a lot of outdoorsy people tend to like it in my city because we have lots of things to do, uh, lots of outdoorsy things to do. Um, I'm born here in Canada, but my, family, my roots are actually from India. So my dad's side's roots are from southern India. My mom's side's roots are more from northern India. I am a really big language learning enthusiast, so I speak five languages currently, English, French, Spanish, Mandarin, and my mother tongue, which is Gujarati, a language from India. Um, and uh, work, work-wise right now, I run what's called the Calgary Language Nerds. So basically, it's a business that uh, we teach a variety of different languages to adults and kids. Mm-hmm. So I personally teach, and then I've got some teachers that work for me as well. That's excellent. Thank you, Azrin. Uh, it's very fantastic that you speak five languages. I mean, uh, I speak like what, two or three languages, which uh, two of them are from my native Nigerian uh, heritage. I speak a language called Yoruba and Igbo, but uh, nothing international. So it's pretty cool that you speak more than uh, one international language. That's awesome. And we'll talk about that in, in our chat. But uh, we really want to start from Azrin is uh, talking about your journey in entrepreneurship. I know mm-hmm. our relationship, at least when I got to know you, was our time running businesses. Can you just share a little bit of an insight into why you started onto this path, how that you know started in the first yeah. place? Yeah. So entrepreneurship and self-employment, that, that journey started when I was about 17 years old. Mm-hmm. I went to this conference. I actually didn't even want to go. I was forced to go by my mom, funnily enough. <laughs> Um, she's like, Azran, you, you have to go to this conference. It's like, it was a very raw, raw, motivational, for lack of a better term, a little bit of a get rich quick kind of conference, to be honest. I was pre-warned in advance by my mom, like, hey, don't buy anything. You might want to buy stuff. They might get stuff to you, but we're not, don't buy anything. Just go try to listen for the learnings, but ignore a lot of the raw, raw stuff, the best of your ability. Okay. Very good mom. <laughs> um, and so that's how it started. Mm-hmm. So initially coming out of that, I, you know, I was basically in a get rich quick kind of mindset. So coming out of it, what my, what a big takeaway I had coming out of that, that two or three day, two or three day workshop, I suppose. One of the big things coming out of it for me was, oh, you, you can become, you can become rich faster than what you thought is what I came out of it thinking like, oh, you can't get rich in, you you can't get rich quickly, but it is faster than you would think. That's what my mindset was. And I didn't really fully understand the work involved in everything and how difficult it really is and the steps that are really involved, but that's how it started. Hmm. And then I tried, I don't even remember what I tried anymore. I think I tried some affiliate marketing stuff. I tried some, I thought Google AdWords or not Google AdWords, Google AdSense, excuse me, I can make money off. I tried all sorts of bizarre things that were not really good ideas, I suppose, to actually earn, you know, a lot of money and become rich, quote unquote. Um, And that's how things started. Yeah. That was like the, the beginning of it. Very, very neat. Actually, you know, when I think about my story as well, my beginning of entrepreneurship was very, very similar to that. I know I used to sell Cutco knives. I'm not sure if you you heard about that. I used to do that. I used to do some insurance stuff as well. Uh, But I basically was dabbling into things that were almost kind of get rich quickly, but not really. Uh, until sort of my path led to uh, running a painting business and yourself, you were running a window cleaning business, right? Can you just share some more insight into that experience, how that happened and just uh, your journey through that? So for about five and a half years, I ran a window cleaning franchise. So there's a a franchise that you're very familiar with, obviously called Mm -hmm. College Pro. And I got to run a window cleaning franchise with them. So Mm -hmm. for four years, I owned a franchise and I operated a franchise. Mm-hmm. And then for about a year, uh, would have been roughly, yes, a year and a half, if I remember correctly, a year and a half that I worked on the corporate side, so on the franchise or mm-hmm. side of things. 
where I helped with recruiting franchisees, training franchisees, and operating operating different franchises across central Canada, so Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Mm -hmm. And that was a really big learning experience. Uh, I learned a, a whole bunch of different things, and and it was a really challenging experience. But I'm very happy that I that I went through it. Absolutely. So, what was that transition like for yourself? Of course, you had that mindset of being an entrepreneur in some version, and then you started running your first real, you know, real life business. Mm -hmm. What was that transition like for yourself? And the reason why I ask that is, you know, there will be some of our listeners who are thinking of launching their first business, and they're not quite sure. Am I up to this? You know, what what does that look like for someone who has no prior experience? How would you explain mm -hmm. that? I think it was it was really difficult for me. Hmm. going into it I'm trying to think back because that was now 10 years ago it's a long time <laughs> wow. yeah, 10 years ago I'm trying to think back exactly what I was thinking I do remember thinking to myself oh I'll just hire people and they'll just do some of the work I don't want to do I remember having that thought process I hadn't even though I was told very clearly the work that's involved and how difficult it is and the hours and all of that I didn't fully understand what that meant until I had to go through it. Mm. So for example, if someone tells you, you have to work 60 to 80 hours a week, cause that's what the work would have been at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've never worked 60 to 80 hours a week, you don't know what that means. You can kind of think you can kind of try and picture it, but you don't really understand what that means until you <laughs> do it. Right. And it's like 7 PM, you started your day at 7 AM and you're like, I'm not done. I still have two more hours of work. It's like, what? <laughs> and at the time it wasn't even just businessy work. Like I was that particular first year, I my business was not doing very well for most of that 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 year. Like mm -hmm. for most of the year until the tail end of it. That's kind of when things started to turn around and it I finished up okay. But it wasn't doing well. So what that meant was I had myself, a guy named Jesse, we're still very close friends today he lived very close to my house at the time so i pick him up on the way to work we'd go and i'd be cleaning windows for 10 hours a day or eight hours a day seven hours a day nine hours a day mm. then you're then i'm doing my marketing my sales calls and my cold calls and then i got my administrative work and then i've got to get my supplies ready for the next day and like you're sore from carrying ladders like it's really it wasn't even just like i'm doing sales for 12 hours a day no no it was like i was doing labor for mm eight of those 12 hours or eight of those whatever hours, you know, because hmm. labor. So. Right. Yeah. You know, that sounds very, very similar to my experience, mm -hmm. especially in my first year where I had to do all of the heavy lifting myself in my second mm -hmm. year, you know, I learned delegation, hiring the right people and whatnot. But what would you say, you know, carried you through those very, very obviously difficult months? Because for me, it was very difficult as well. Hauling ladders, climbing on buildings, painting houses, uh, and combining it with like sales and marketing, doing estimates. What would you say kept you going in those very tough periods? Why didn't you just quit and just go have like a, you know, $10, $15 an hour job or whatever? Why did you keep going? I wasn't allowed. <laughs> no, I'm not like, I don't think, first of all, I don't think I thought about quitting. Mm. I don't think I even, I don't, I'm trying to remember back now, but I don't think I thought about quitting. Mm. In fact, the whole five and a half years with that company, I, there were really tough times, but I don't, I don't think I ever thought about quitting. There were times where I wasn't sure if I'd sign a contract for another year, that for sure. But it, mm. when I, once I'd signed one, I never thought about quitting during that contract. Hmm. Um, if I'm trying to remember back why, I think, I think I, like, I wasn't allowed by my mother. Like that would have been a big one. I don't think I would have been allowed to. And then there's termination. Mm. Like, like I'm not gonna, like I didn't wanna pay the termination to break the contract. And I wasn't allowed anyway from home, like the home pressure of, it wasn't pressure even, it wasn't even a pressure, but if I, I know if I were to quit, grandparents would ask, oh, what happened? Why did you quit? Mom would ask, like, it would be a week, it would, it would have not been allowed. It would have been mm. very strange. Mm. I don't even think I even thought about it. I don't mm. even think like, I wish I could quit. I don't even think I thought that. I don't remember thinking that. Now, that's a significant mindset, whether that's by design or just the way it happened due to yeah. you know, your environment. But I find personally that, you know, if 
I don't have a mindset where you know failure is an option, then you don't even think about failure. The question is, okay, this is a new challenge. How do I get around it? And uh, I, I think that's a very interesting mindset, especially in that fourth year of business when you know things are really, really tough and you know you're, you're trying to make a decision. But I'm curious, Azrain, what would you say was your biggest takeaway from that fourth year? What, what was the biggest learning experience for yourself from that fourth year of, of running a business? Um, I think looking back at it, and if you'd asked me when I was 18, I think my answer would have been very different. I don't know what I would have told you. I actually don't know, but I can mm -hmm. tell you as of right now, um, I think one of the big, one of the big, big learning points from that year and, and really any of those years, to be honest, any of the years I worked in that franchise really mm -hmm. was, <clears throat> uh, being able to work long hours and understanding what that's like mm. and understanding how to do it, what it feels like um, to the point where now a 40 hour work, like the traditional 40 hour work week to me now is super easy. I don't work the same hours I used to when I was at that company. I do work Oh, and you know what, actually, I might actually work the same amount of hours, actually, a very similar amount of hours. Now that I'm thinking about it, I might still work 60 ish. Uh, I don't think I do 80. I don't think I do 80 anymore. That doesn't, mm. I can't quite, I don't want to do that. Not sustainable. <laughs> 60. Easy. Yeah. 60 for sure. Like what mm. is 60? I work Monday to Monday to Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. 60 easily, easily mm. 60 easy. Mm. And that's not, it feels very sustainable. Very, Absolutely. very sustainable. It does not, I don't get tired. I don't, I, I get, I sleep. I mm. eat health, reasonably healthily. I, like, okay, yeah. So I think that's one of the big things. You know, I, I definitely identify with that as well. I think work ethic is kind of what you're trying to allude to. You really learn the idea of having a strong work ethic. And I thought even for myself, after my first year of real you know, business ownership, I you know I think my, my success in my first year was just break even and not owing anybody any money. Mm -hmm. But I think after that first year I took away was, what, what I took away was that I can outwork anybody. Like if it's about doing the hard work, I can do it. Like that is no longer a problem. And I thought that, you know, moving forward, it really gave me that motivation to meet any challenges because I know that I can put in the hard work. If that's all I can do, if that's a bare minimum, I will show up, I will do the hard work. Can I improve my skill levels? Sure. Can I improve anything else? Sure. But hard work, if you can show up, you're good. I think that's a good lesson for anyone, you know, going to their first year of business, business ownership. Yeah. So it's funny. I want to add on that. So here's a funny thing. I heard, I heard, I was listening to someone else's podcast and I heard an interesting comment mm -hmm. where the individual, the individual being interviewed is the, is a name, is a, is a man by the name of Joey, Joey Diaz. Mm -hmm. And he's a, he's a stand-up comedian. He does, he's done some acting work. He's in some movies, not a lot, but and he's a podcaster now. And so one, he made a comment, which was interesting. It was something to the effect of, you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of being successful is just showing up and sticking around. And I was like, that's so funny. Cause when I think back to like my college pro days, like hmm. I wasn't necessary. I was probably not the most skilled, like most of the time. Now, once I had more experience, I would be, but mm -hmm. like initially when I'd start a year in the franchise or try to do something new, like I was not. I'd probably be one of the least skilled actually, to be honest, but when others would leave or they quit or they'd, they, they'd, you know, they terminate their contract and such. I didn't, I didn't do that. So what that would mean is I would have stuff given to me. I would have business given to me because they would mm -hmm. need help. They'd be like, Hey, we had someone who quit. Azrin, do you want it? And I'd be like, okay, I guess so. I wouldn't say no. I would just take it. I just take, say yes. And then that would just happen year. That's how I got all my promotions. Mm. They just needed help with something. And I'd be like, Hey, we need this. Can you help? I'd be like, uh, I don't know how, but sure. <laughs> um, there's like a time where someone in the U S had something had happened with some general manager and they needed help. And so they had some people in Canada that just like myself and I think three others, maybe four others. Mm. So like a lot of stuff that happened was just just a matter of that I hadn't quit. I just kind of stuck at the same company. Absolutely. I think and you, it showed up. Yeah. And you kind of make your luck in some way, if you stick at it and if you're there and if you're in the arena, uh, you get things, you know, you, you get benefits from just being in the arena and not quitting. Yep. And I think that would say yeah. that's you get a lot of benefits literally just for showing up and not leaving, mm -hmm. which is really crazy. 
It is. It is. Yeah. Now, if we switch gears a little bit, of course, you know, you run your business for a couple of years and you transition into more of a, a manager, general manager, coaching kind of role. Can you just share mm-hmm. a little bit more on that experience, how that shaped you or how or that evolution for, for you as, a, as an entrepreneur moving into that role? It was really hard. It was really difficult. Recruiting was specifically hard for me. Mm. That, I remember that being really difficult. Recruiting was hard, both in terms of finding new people to work as well as uh, retention was also quite initially was quite difficult. Hmm. Mm, Yeah, it was quite, it was quite hard. I think the other thing in hindsight, which is interesting looking back is when you, when you are, when I was a general manager, you have a lot of control, especially as you know, because we we both worked at the same company, like you have a lot of control in terms of what you do, Mm -hmm. but a lot of stuff comes from above you. And the stuff that you have to enforce hmm. and this, so you're not fully leading with the way that you personally would lead things. Hmm. And that can lead, that can lead to, you know, that led to me making some decisions that in hindsight, I don't agree with the decisions I make. And I hmm. feel I treated certain people. I don't know if I treated them as well as I should have right. in that moment. Right. Hmm. Um, that's something for sure. I think being able to, being able to lead is a difficult skill that was hard for me initially Mm. um very very challenging right and it would be interesting i actually would be very interested to see how i would do in that same position if i were to go do the position today because i think i'd be a million times better at it like i genuinely think be a lot better at it very very interesting point you made about leadership and i believe as entrepreneurs that's just something you it's not a skill that you master at from day one but you have to grow that skill if you want to have any sort of you know major accomplishment because ultimately we can't do everything ourselves you have to rely on your people you have to rely on people under you to carry out some of those things what would you say was your biggest you know takeaway in terms of building skills and leadership how did you navigate that uh building that skills for, for yourself I think myself trial and error, doing Mm. things, realizing it doesn't work or being told it doesn't work. If I didn't realize that my up, my supervisor is saying, Hey man, that's not working. (laughs) You got to try something different. So whether I'm me realizing it personally or, or realizing it through someone telling me one of the two, Mm. this is not working. You've got to try something different. Absolutely. Trial and error, trial and error, pattern recognition. That's a really big thing for myself. I think it's something I'm quite good at. That's something that comes natural to me. Mm. When I try any new skill, business or not, I tend to be worse at it than most people when I first start at mm. most skills. I'm, I tend to be worse to the point where for many things I've tried, people are shocked at how bad I am. Mm. They're just baffled. They're like, like, how could you not know how to do this? Like, it's really interesting. I've experienced that since childhood where I try things like you can't do that. And they're, they're very surprised. Mm. But what I'm also, I think I'm just very good at it is I'm good at pattern recognition and I'm good at being like, oh, that's what I have to do. Okay. And then doing that and then learning how to do that and just kind of understanding and seeing things and seeing what, being able to break it down into smaller steps. Hmm. I know how to follow those steps and learn that skill. So with the leadership side, same thing, I would kind of find and see certain patterns like, oh, this is what I have to do. Oh, don't do that. Cause you did that before you went down that path before that didn't work. Okay. Let's try this path, you know? Hmm. You know, that's actually very, very interesting pattern recognition because, you know, I am a big fan of just human psychology, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, there's generally like there's something called the Myers-Briggs personality type. I'm not sure Mm -hmm. if that's something you're familiar with. And there are two ways generally people can absorb information. We have what we call the sensors and we have what we call the intuitives. Now, the sensors rely mostly on what their five senses can, you know, can uh, can feel. So what they see, what they can touch, what they can smell to basically absorb information. And then there are the intuitives who look at what's in the background, what's not very obvious. Would you categorize yourself more in that uh, in that space where you're looking at how everyone is doing or what the behavior is what the results are and then you're using that to make some inference on how to move forward is that does that sound like uh, what you, when you say p- p- uh, pattern matching is that what, what you what you're i thinking? think so yeah i think so it's where i see i tried to do x mm. it didn't work so then i tried to do y and that worked a little bit better so now when i try to do that same thing i'm gonna do y and i'm not gonna do x Hmm. Very, very and now when I see someone else do X, I can say, oh, I've done X before. That X didn't work. Hmm. I then tried Y and Y worked a lot better. Hmm. 
Very, very neat. Uh, let's make some some transition here. Um, so, you know, it's been great learning about sort of your experience on both sides of the aisle, but now you've transitioned back to self-employment, you're running your own business teaching language. Um, has language always been a passion for yourself or how did you get into whole languages? Like, tell me the story about that. So language has not always been a passion, but it has been for a long time. I would say it's been a passion. It's been a passion since about the age of 16 roughly 15, 16, somewhere in there. So in high mm -hmm. school. Um, but it's always been a part of my life and it always has been something I've had at least some level of interest in. Because I grew up with three. I grew up with English, obviously, because mm -hmm. I'm born and raised in Canada. I spoke Gujarati with my family. And then I learned, went to a French immersion school. So mm -hmm. my education was primarily in French. So it's always been a part of my life, but really since high school is where it started to really build um, and where I really started to get interested in it. Very, very cool. And when did you decide or make that decision to teach languages? Because of, of course, it's one thing to just be passionate about it and wanting to learn as many as you can, but then transferring that knowledge to others. How did that decision came around? Uh, happened in 20, started in 2016, but I would, uh, 20, uh, so it been 2017. But, yeah, 2017, I guess probably would be the official start, but 2016 is when I kind of started thinking about it and making a little bit of content and, and things of that nature. Hmm. Um, the way it started was there's a couple things happening simultaneously all around the same time. Hmm. So the company I worked in, um, I had, I, I just, I was kind of on the fence about transitioning out and that was already happening. And then at the same time, I came across this video where it's like teen speaks 25 languages or something like that. And I was like, what the heck is this? And I like watched this video and there's like all these comments being like, oh, you're so good. That's so amazing. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, that could have been me if I would realized that language learning is a thing at a younger age. I was like, oh man, that, that could have been me. And I was like, wow, that's so interesting. So I started to Google it and I was like, wow, there's like poly, there's like uh, language learning conferences. And so I was like, what the heck? There's a whole world around this. That's so fascinating. What the heck? Hmm. Maybe I can do something with this. Hmm. So that's kind of where it, the, the seed started. You were mentioning some word polyglot. Is polyglot, it like, yeah. Okay, what, what, what does that mean? How does that relate to languages? Polyglot means someone who speaks more, basically a bunch of, a lot of languages. Oh, so. I mean, it's more, I believe it's, I don't actually know what the technical definition, I think it's four or more, but as I'm thinking about it, I don't even know what the technical definition is. Hmm. I think it's four or more because four is, or three is trilingual. I don't think there's a quadrilingual. I don't think that's a thing, is it? No, I don't think so. A poly think would be like four or five, four or five or more. You start to get into polyglot land. Hmm, interesting. Now, I'm very curious, Azrin. Um, it sounded to me like your transition into self-employment had a layer of something you actually had a natural passion mm -hmm. or interest in, and mm -hmm. something you felt like maybe there was some uh, financial way to make money out of it. So, for someone who is trying to, you know, start their next company or their next business or try to be self-employed, what would be your advice be when they're choosing what to go into? What sh what questions should they be asking themselves, and how should they decide? Okay, maybe this is something I want to kind of go all in to start my new business in. Um, for me personally, if I were in their shoes, like just based on my life experience, maybe a thought that I would add to the pot is thinking about things that, um, that they like, like, what do, what do you like? And what are you, I think you got to think about what you're, what are you good at? And what do you like? Hmm. Hopefully what you like is what you're good at. Some people, that's not the case. You might be a, you might love singing, but only be mediocre sure. and that's okay. But then you just got to kind of look yourself in the mirror and say, okay, I love singing more than life, but I'm only, fine at it and I'm like pretty good but I'm not the best and then you understand that you're not going to be Beyonce you might be someone who you know makes a living as a local musician or something right mm -hmm. um maybe you maybe you're super good at something but you don't really like it that's something that happens too mm -hmm. you know you, you got to think about that I don't know if there's I don't know if you shouldn't do it I don't know if you should do it I that 
I don't know if there's a right answer. Hmm. Hopefully there's something that you, hopefully you can find the thing that you like the most that you're the best at and try and build something around that. I think that's a good way to view it. Right. So it's kind of a balancing act almost. What am I good at? And then, you know, what do I like? And trying to just kind of find that balance because ultimately I'm guessing you are happy at what you do. So it's almost not work for you because you would naturally be doing this anyway. So, you know, making this, uh, making this a business is more like even cherry on top of the cake, right? Yeah, I, for, it is work for me. It is work. That's for sure. Mm. Um, it def, It's definitely not like I wake up and it's, I don't want to, like, I don't feel like work. It, it definitely is work. I'm going to work and I'm doing my job and I'm answering my emails and teaching. And, um, but I, I like what I do. Like I mm. like it. And I, often would not often not always but often there's not much else i would rather have been doing anyway right but it is work like it's hard and it makes my brain work and i'm thinking and like mm-hmm. people ask me hard questions sometimes what language and i'm like hmm, i don't know what that is or you know you've got certain headaches in the business that have nothing to do with language by the way i, t- I do teach so that's not the majority it's a big chunk of my schedule but it's not mm. my entire schedule there's like Someone asked me today, hey, Azra, I'm thinking of moving. One of my teachers works for me just this morning. She's like, hey, I'm thinking of moving from Canada. Does that affect me being able to work? Like, then you got to think about that. Oh, mm. teacher's going to be moving. She said, okay, now you got to deal with those logistics. Do you have to move for students? Do you have to do that? Do you have to? And I was like, oh, okay. Right. right. So it's not just language, even though I like languages. Once you're in the business of what you do, it's mm. you don't just do that often, depending on what the skill set is and what the field is. You don't often just do that. Hmm. skill anymore there's other things involved especially if you're hiring people Hmm. and it's not going to be a one-man show especially in that situation absolutely absolutely and that's i think that's a very very important point because it's not just the actual stuff there's obviously a lot of things around it and that actually pivots to my next question which is okay you've decided this is what i'm passionate about this is what i like doing and then you've you know made a decision okay this is kind of i can be good at this i enjoy doing this and you kind of made that balancing act what should be your first step so you've decided you want to go into it, for, I guess, for yourself, what was the first few activities you took to launch this and make it official? Um, the first things that I did personally, what did I do? Let me think back. One of the early, so the first thing I started doing was making content. I just started making content about language learning. I was in China, actually, because I traveled a little, I was traveling, and I decided I would document a lot of my Mandarin learning. And that's how I started initially. Um, I was doing a little bit of online teaching at the time, a little bit, Mm, Mm. not much, a couple of students. Um, And then I think once I came back, I took, I still, I took a couple of months to month or two to kind of get back into Calgary life and everything. Um, Yes. I think I remember now that I'm thinking about it. I'm pretty sure that the first things I started doing is I started to actually look for, yeah, I started looking for students. That's what I did. That's the first thing I started to do. I started to look for students. So I would go, I post ads online, like on classified websites, um, Craigslist, Kijiji, things like that. Um, I would cold email. uh, I would, I remember now. Yeah. I used to cold email campus French and Spanish clubs. And then I'd be like, Hey, can I offer your club? I think I used to do five hours of free classes for anyone who's interested, no strings attached. And then I think I did two because five was like a lot. And I was like, okay, I'll do two hours. I was like, one is kind of not enough because one's just like a sales call basically. Like, it's not cool. Like it's like, but two, that's pretty good. Two or three, that's pretty good. Hmm. So I started to do that. And that's where some of my initial students came from. Some came from online classifieds websites. Some came from, you know, I do those two, three, four, five hours of free classes with people. Some of them would convert to paying students. Some of them wouldn't. Um, but it was okay. I knew it was a no strings attached thing. It was just, I just knew if you do enough of that, you're going to have some that, and when you don't have any work, you, all you have is time. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, no issue. Right. Hmm. I think that's a really, really important point you've made there. And, you know, when I think about it, I, 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 I operate with the mindset of, I, I prefer, you know, giving out more in value than what you ask for in payment. And I think it's even more so important if you're launching out your entrepreneurship career or you're launching your new business is not to be focused on what you're getting back, right? It's to be focused on how much am I giving away right now to add value such that you can think about me when you think of uh, the service I offer. Yeah, would I'd you agree. agree with that? Yeah. I'd agree. And I also just think like you have to do it in a way that's profitable as well. Like notice, like I didn't, 
I had no cost starting off. Like mm-hmm. I had no, I had no costs. I t- so myself, I am someone who, I think you have to. Be, let's take a step back. I've heard people say things like, "Oh, you know, when a startup, you've got to spend money to make money," which is there's truth to it. I'm not saying it's not true. There is some truth to it. In a startup, you have to spend money to make some money. You know, it's very common to not make any money for the first X number of years. It's common to have some. Maybe you take a loan or debt or investment and. There's truth to that, especially in other business, certain business types, there might be Mm -hmm. some truth to that. I think so. Mm. Um, But I personally am someone that thinks I'm very profit driven. You need to be making a profit. You can't just take a loan or like, I know someone who they spent, I think it was something like $7,000 on a particular, uh, I don't want to give too many details because I know this person, but if they spent thousands of dollars on something Mm. and their mindset was, yeah, I think it should be pretty good. I think it's a lot of money. It's a pretty big hit to the bank account. Like I would never do that. Hmm. That would not, I wouldn't do it. I would never take a, like a big fine, not a big financial risk where I go, Ooh, like, I don't know. I wouldn't do that. Hmm. I do take financial risks, but risks where I'm a hundred percent. Okay. With it going to zero. Hmm. Hmm. 100% in my head, like, Oh yeah, I'm going to do that. It's a bit of a risk, but if I lose that money, I'm fine. It doesn't affect my livelihood. doesn't affect anything. That's okay to go to zero. That's mm. the risk I would tend to take. Mm. I don't know if everyone's like that. Yeah, I guess not. But uh, yeah, that, that's a very important uh, point to make about, you know, not just like putting all your money out there and hoping and hoping and praying that you will get it back. You have to be very mm-hmm. strategic. Now, uh, one of the things you, you mentioned as well was you, you really in, uh, you, you invested in trying to get customers. Uh, and you wanted to have sort of a, a proof of concept that this actually works. And that was almost like the very first thing you were trying to do. Of course, you were creating content, but you were still trying to get your first customer. Would that be something that you would say if an entrepreneur or someone who is starting a business should be their main priority, try and put out content, put out value, but also try and get your first customer, your second customer? I would, I would think so. I, I think so. Um, I can't speak for everyone's situation, but... As I'm thinking about it now, like I think for a vast, a very big percentage of people getting customers and having income coming in, coming in is, should be a big focus. Um, I would think so, but I am thinking, I'm not sure. I, I'm thinking more in the term, in terms of like, if you have a product-based business, service-based business, if you have something that's more like an app, I don't have much experience with them. Like, oh, I'm not sure if that's, I would think so, but I don't know, you know? I mean, I would think that your first customer would be, you know, whether they are using your app and using yeah. it consistently, right? So like a daily yep. active user, and that would be your sort of customer metric. Or mm-hmm. if it's a service, someone who is taking your class or buying your products, uh, you want someone to show that this actually works. The proof of concept, I guess, is what I I'm, think I'm services driving. and products. Yeah, like I think generally speaking, services and products, I can say pretty confidently based on my experience, like, yeah, you should going for customers you should be having some paying customers right. what are you doing isn't that the purpose of it isn't that one of the main purposes of a business ultimately yeah that's the whole point of a business is to have some customers in some fresh in some fashion mm-hmm. right yeah very very neat so um i'm just again when i think about languages again it's not a passion of mine i think it's very very cool but why would you say languages are important like why is it important or why should people care about learning new languages i don't think people should hmm. i don't think you should if you want to, that's great. I don't think you necessarily should. So to be honest with you. That's fair. For people who learn more languages, is there any impact aside from the fact that you can communicate with others? Like what would you yeah, say I is think the benefits to it for sure? For um sure. I think the benefits of knowing other languages, uh, there are scientific there's benefits for your brain. It's a good brain exercise. It's just a very good exercise for your brain. Um when you travel and if you're a traveler it makes life way easier if you speak the 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 country's language uh when you speak another language um assuming you well what assuming you go and communicate with people that speak that other language you're going to meet people from a very different cultural background so you're going to bump into customs traditions ways of viewing the world norms that are not the same as yours and that will make you a much more um, well-rounded person, a much more understanding person, a much more empathetic person. Um, It it helps you, 
to be honest with you, I think it helps you even to have a taste of it helps in business because for instance, I know that I'll give you, let's give a heart, let's give a really concrete example. I know that many Indians, it's a stereotype, but many Indians, people from India are not going to schedule things the same way that I would schedule something with a Canadian. I can tell a Canadian, hey, let's, it's a Monday. Why don't we meet on Friday at noon and we're going to, we can talk about such and such thing. You would generally expect that Canadian to be like, okay, sure. And then you would generally expect that they're going to show up unless something comes up, but generally they're going to show up. Um, with many people in India, not everybody, but it's something I've noticed commonly when I was there, it'd be very common where the, where that's not exactly how that works. It's not really mm. going to work that same way. Mm. Now, if you didn't know that, you might be like, what the heck's wrong with the, what the heck's wrong with this person? Mm. And then when you, when you've experienced, I've lived it and I've breathed it and I've seen it firsthand. I'm like, oh, that's just not how they communicate and schedule things. That's not how it works for, for certain people, not everybody, obviously, mm. but for certain people, that's not the process you would generally tend to follow. Mm. I would have to follow up a day before that's just how it works. I'd be like, Hey, just checking every soul meeting tomorrow. Oh, I don't know about this. Can we, can we check in tomorrow? Sure. So I would have like three, four things scheduled. When I was in India, I was in India for two months. I was doing, I would have three or four things scheduled for like the same block of time, hmm. knowing that three of them are not, it's going to fall through. Internet's going to break. That's a thing over there. Internet breaks traffic and this and that. And so it's a much more dynamic kind of lifestyle that we don't operate that way. So I would actually get more done by understanding that system of doing things. I would actually get more done hmm. Than I would hear because here I'm like, oh, one hour or half hour, one thing versus there. I'm like, oh, I can do this thing. I can do that thing. Okay. That's scheduled here. Oh, that's going to, okay. I can cut that half hour short, get that extra meeting here. If he shows up while I'm with this person, I know exactly how this is going to play out. I'm going to schedule two things at the same time that if they both show up, we can actually do both at the same time. That's going to, and pff, I was way more productive right. in many ways. That but you a, wouldn't know that unless you spoke the language and lived there and breathed it and talked to the people and really got to know them. You're like, oh, it's different here, different mm. speed of life. You wouldn't know that otherwise. And you would probably just judge it mm. and you wouldn't be able to do business in that environment. That is a particularly uh, insightful uh, you know, comment there, especially in today's world where it's, you know, we're, we're a global village and mm. with the internet and technology, you get to work with more and more people from all walks of life. And I think having an understanding of the languages and the nuances of other people from other culture uh, really, really helps in strengthening communications, improving business relationships and, and all. Yeah, so that's a, that's definitely a, a very great, great point. So uh, you're, you're passionate about language. What would you say is your, your most uh, favorite language, I, I would say, from all the ones you've spoken, you, you know, so far? Usually my favorite one is the one that I'm working on in the moment. So right now I'm working mostly on Mandarin and then my mother tongue, which is Gujarati. So mm -hmm. yeah, so those are the, my, some of my favorites, I'd say. And how would you, so if I'm interested in learning a new language, for example, mm -hmm. what should be my first step? What should I be doing? Should I start, I, personally myself, I would think maybe watching a TV show. I love a lot of Korean shows. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. typically watch Korean shows, but what would you say should be your first step if you're interested in exploring a new language? Yep, totally. Um, so I would say if you're trying to learn a new language, yeah, the, fir the first things I would probably do is um, whatever in your, so the first thing I would do is when you think about that language, what are some of the first things that, if there's anything comes to mind for you that, oh, I'd love to do blah, 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 go do those first. Start with those. Mm. So you're like, oh, if I was like Korean, I'd love to watch a Korean drama. Like, oh, that'd be so funny. Like, start there. Mm. Start with that. Mm. Um, yeah, that's where I would start. That's where I start for sure. And um, and for yourself, so you you do coaching, so you would basically teach people one on one. And how would how to, how does those sessions typically go? Are you mm -hmm. having them uh, learn like the basic pronouns or understand that the foundation? Can you share so, some insight on that. Let's assume it's a private class because group classes are a little bit a little bit different. But let's say it's private one on one, like in your coaching environment. Let's say for instance, right. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I'm paying very close attention to is. Uh, what I learn, what I learn about that person's personality, their learning style, what kind of person they are, what they do for work, their, how many hours they work, are they morning person, night person? That doesn't take me very long to figure out. I can usually get that pretty darn quickly. Um, I just have a lot of people experience now that I can just see a lot of it quite quickly. Mm. So that's the first thing I'm paying attention to because the types of things I'll tell them to do are very different depending on the type of person. Right. Someone with a type A, very type A style of personality 
we're going to use a lot of tables and charts and goals and checklists. And we're going to have all sorts of things like that. And they're going to have all these things to check off and, Oh, I hit that. Yes. And mm -hmm. right? um, someone who, someone who I, someone who works more than 60 hours a week will never do their homework and right. they're going to cancel half the classes. I already know that it, mm -hmm. it's just nine times out of 10. That's how the class is going to go. And so we immediately have to set that framework that, Hey, you need to come to class, but you're not going to do any homework. Mm -hmm. They'll say, really? Shouldn't I try? Okay. Let's try this week. <laughs> Next week later they go, Oh my God, you're right. I'll never do homework. Yeah, I know you won't do homework. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so depending on the end schedule. Uh, um, there's certain people that are very structured, like um, very um, logical. Um, I suppose the introverted logical type of person um, is going to probably want a very structured program. So we're going to have, they're going to know the roadmap from day one. We're going to know, we're going to, you know, unit one, we're going to learn pronouns, this, that. We're going to learn through alphabet. We're going to do this. Unit two. And mm. it's just going to be very, very laid out. So you know, mm. oh, okay, that's what we're doing. Someone who's more easygoing and kind of more creative and such probably won't have that. And it's going to be very, very go, um, not go with the flow, but. Um, fluid, maybe? Fluid, yeah, a lot more fluid. Like, so that's, I'm very, and I'm very good at, I'm very good at working with people. So when I work with people, I know I can tell very quickly what we're going to do. And it's very different. Hmm. And yeah, uh, thanks for giving me insight. That really helps you understand things from your perspective. And I really like your, your last point about, you know, really working with people and understanding people. And I know this has been an area of growth, I guess, for everybody, but even more so as an entrepreneur. Uh, one of the things I always like talking about is the, the role of soft skills and emotional yeah. intelligence in really being able to build a successful business. I know when we were preparing for this podcast, you, you had a very interesting perspective on, on how you've grown in your soft skills. Can you just share with me what you think the role of soft skills slash emotional intelligence is in, in career success yeah i think it's i think if i think you have to lean into your strengths some people don't have that that's not a really big strength for them so you've got to be right you've got to round the skill off but i don't necessarily think you're going to be the person that's really got to heavily lean into that if it's not really a natural a natural strength for you i'll give you a great example my mom really understands people she can see when she she looks at you and you say something she know she really understands she can she hears you and she gets it but what her strength isn't is being likable hmm. that's not her strength she's a very direct and blunt person she says what she means and she'll just say it and it'll be true and because it's true and it's the pure truth unfiltered unsugarcoated there's people where it's like whoa what hmm. right so with that, that type of what, if you, that's the type of person you are, you know, maybe learning to sugarcoat a little bit and, and having a little bit more tact is a good idea, but you're not going to go into a position where you need to always be super tactful. That's not going to be appropriate for you. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's number one. Now for, you know, I do think it's very important having emotional skills. And I do think that, you know, to read people, understand how to be nice, how to, have interactions and everything is very, how to play nice with other people. It's obviously very, very um, important. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, the, the beginning point of doing that is awareness. So it all comes mm -hmm. from having an understanding of who you are, uh, what your strengths and weaknesses are, and then walking from based on that framework of, of knowledge. What would you say would, I guess, maybe for yourself, would you say there are the activities or steps you've taken to really have that understanding of yourself to then make that step forward of navigating that? Um, things that I've done, there's nothing specific. That's my deep, my, that how I'm born and how I'm wired is to view things in very step-by-step -step fashions, which has a very, which has positive and positives and negatives to it. Mm. There's good and bad to that. Um, it means that when I run businesses, they don't grow fast, but they grow. So that's an interesting, they'll always grow, but they're not, I'll, I've never been the type and it's always been a weakness of mine. You know, those people, I know people when I back where I used to work that would be able to go and find like 50 leads in like two weeks. And they just do, they just have, they would do something that I don't know. They have, they have some gear in them. There's something that they're doing. I could follow the exact same steps and I wouldn't get the same results, but they do those steps. And somehow they get these 50 leads and you're like, what the heck? How? That's mm -hmm. not, that's not how I am. I'm a very step-by-step -step, one brick at a time, which is good and bad in many ways. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's just something that's in me to be able to break stuff down. Um, I will share the thing we talked about it during the, cause I think it'll help a lot of people. Well, when we were chatting, when we were prepping for this, um, 
one thing that's really helped me on my EQ side of skill, EQ side of things on the emotional intelligence side is uh, viewing emotional intelligence in a very logical fashion. So again, going back to pattern recognition, um, noticing patterns and giving myself rules to follow to, to do the behaviors that I know are the right behaviors. So I'll give an example, I'll give a couple of examples. Um, <clears throat> Uh, actually, I'll give you two examples. I just thought of one that I forgot about until right now. Hmm. Um, when I was first working as a general manager uh, back at, in the window cleaning business, hmm. I remember very vividly being given a piece of feedback that I cannot use the word man when talking to someone in a recruiting context. Hmm. Because I use that all the time. And I was trying to be kind of cool but it came across really weird. It was super awkward. Like and even thinking back, I remember how I used to talk. It was a very, <laughs> I was trying to be cool and it wasn't cool. It was just very like, what are you doing? It's like, that was a rule like, oh, okay. I can't use the word man. Like that's a very logical, tangible thing that makes me better at people skills, mm. right? And I have lots of little rules that eventually become, I don't think, oh, don't use the word man. I don't think of that. I don't do that anymore, but like, mm. I remember there's a point where I had to think about that. I was like, don't do that. Cause that is not like, you look weird. Hmm. You sound weird. Sorry. Yeah. So I give myself very specific rules to follow. Um, yeah. Give myself very specific rules to follow. That's very, very fascinating because personally for myself, I'm not, I'm not a really logical person. I, mm-hmm. if you will, I'm more of an intuitive person, right? Uh, more of a feeler and emotions and kind of just mm-hmm. a little fluid. I think for myself, one of the tools that has helped me in building and increasing my emotional intelligence skills is to journal. So basically, you know, depending on the mood or how I feel, I basically just write that down. And writing that down almost is like a self-dialogue in a way where there are almost two people and we're talking to each other and we're able to manage emotions, we're able to manage feelings, we're able to gain insights from experiences as they happen. And then in the future, when I feel that same sort of feeling, whether it's not positive or negative, I've had a great week where, you know, I close a lot of contracts and whatnot, I write how I felt and my process. And if I'm feeling the opposite end, I go to read what I wrote when I felt where I wanted to be at. And then it helps me really, you know, center my mind to know that that is very possible. And, you know, this is how you felt, you know, it's, it is possible to get there and basically retrace my way back to that point that I want to be at. And I, I felt like, that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. yeah, I just felt like, you know, recording things and writing them down was huge in me understanding myself better and being able to improve my performance. Yeah, my version of that, it's uh, it's similar, but a slightly different version. And this is less of emotional, I guess it's emotional intelligence, but it's also just helping yourself get through ruts. Um, I'll give you this analogy. If you're going to go get super drunk, mm-hmm. you have to have planned that out in advance. True. You have to know that you can't drive your car. You have to know that if I'm going to be super drunk, you should probably know where you're going to be crashing before you go get completely wasted. Um, you should probably know that you're going to be with some friends for safety. Like you, you're going to have to do a little bit of, hopefully, unless it was a spur of the moment, <laughs> thing, which case, that happens, whatever. But if you know, so often, you know, your part, your birthday's coming, you know, your thing, you know, New Year's Eve is coming, you know, whatever's coming, you know, you're going to go do your thing and you know, you're not driving, you know, you're going to Uber back, you know, you have no work the next day. You've got certain things you've planned it when you were in a sober mindset, mm. when you're sober, you made a couple little arrangements to make sure you don't die. Basically. Exactly. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> when it comes to emotional intelligence, I think, I think of it the same way when you're in a rut it's the same as being drunk. You don't think straight. You can't mm. think straight. You're not in the right mindset to think straight. Same thing when you're super high, you don't think straight, right? You mm. think straight probably like right now, like when we're kind of sitting here and we're not really I'm in a good mood, not in a terrible mood, not in a great mood, not I'm just doing okay. That's right. generally when you think straight. Mm. And so what helps me is that when I'm thinking straight, I've already prepared, um, it's on my phone actually, I've got certain YouTube playlists that I'm like, oh yeah, I'll probably need that video if I'm in a really bad place. I should probably watch that. I've got a note file where I've written stuff for myself. Mm. So when stuff is really bad, you're not thinking straight, right? And you don't know what to do, but I have one thought in my head, which is, oh, I'm in a bad spot. I just have to go to that note file and go to that video playlist and just scroll through. You're going to find what you need in there. Hmm. And then you do, you're like, oh yeah, right. I 
forgot about that. <laughs> might be like, kind of like the pre-drunk planning of knowing you're not working the next day. It's okay. You can be hung over. Mm. You, know, you can, you're not driving. So you'll be good there. You're, you know, you're in an Uber back. You got your phone. It's charged. Like you've done a couple mental things. Mm. I think it's the same thing for that too. And I do that and it's really helpful. Yeah, that's amazing insight. And I guess everyone has to find what system works best for them. Is it listening to a playlist? Is it you know, talking to a trusted friend and just kind of, you know, uh, bouncing off ideas or sharing how you feel to help sure you, you know, you're centered? Or is it writing in a journal? And that seems to work well for me. So I guess everyone has to learn it for themselves. That's an awesome insight. I guess that the last phase of our questions I want to talk about was the pandemic. So of course we're we're in a pandemic, and I'm very curious for yourself: has that changed anything for you? You know, from the perspective of how you work, how you run your business, how you relate to others, how you just you know living life. How has that changed anything for yourself? Yeah, things have changed. I'm mostly home. That's mm -hmm. a big change. Uh, I was home a lot before too, but I did in person. I did a lot of in person things. Mm -hmm. um, now I do nothing in person, or very very little in person. That's a big change. I think everybody can probably relate to that. Mm. Um, we do a lot more things online like I'm way better at online I used to teach online a lot as well but I never did groups for example online I didn't know technologically how to do that it's not actually that difficult it's zoom mm. and it's really simple it's not hard but I didn't know how to do it and I was like how what? that sounds so hard <laughs> now I know how to do it um I yeah I mean those are some key, like right off the top of my mind, those are two quick changes that come up, I think. Right. And I'm curious, and you don't have to answer this question if you don't mm -hmm. have any answer, but considering all those changes that is happening or, well, that we are forced to go through, what would you think would, how would that change the future for us? Like, do you see this impacting any massive change, whether it's at an individual level or at a, a cultural level mm -hmm. of our generation? What do you see this changing in the future? I don't really know, but I can give some initial thoughts. I mean, I think it'll change quite a bit. I think it really will change a lot, um, especially when you look at, there's a lot of people that are, mm, there's a lot of people that are very emotionally affected by this. And when we come out of it, that's gonna play out in one way, shape or form. Could be good ways, could be bad ways, could be neutral, could just like, but it's gonna change something. Mm. I would not be shocked if in a year or two, there's a huge surge in travel mm. because people can't travel now. And so people have to splurge. Right. 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 I would not be shocked if there's, I would not be shocked if there is a really big hit to like a stock, the stock markets and economy and economy in general, not the stock market, but I think economy in general, I would not be surprised. I'm not an expert. I'm just guessing. Mm. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I think it's going to affect us for longer than what some people might think. Like, I wouldn't be shocked if we're affected for another five years. Mm. Now, not in the sense of like, oh, people are getting sick and things of that nature, but more in the sense of like cultural changes or like, you know, um, ways we view the world, um, cultural norms. Like we're going to, some, we're going to feel stuff. I would guess for long, I don't know if it's five years, but longer mm. than what I think people think, some people think. Yeah. I definitely agree with you. I think one way or the other day I'll be changed. The question is, you no, know, is it going to be for good or for bad? Or, you know, I guess changing itself is not a good or bad thing. It's just what it is. It's how we respond to it that, you know, really defines what changes. Mm -hmm. For myself, I think one of the things or the biggest learning points in terms of insights for me has been the understanding of, of the concept of time. So mm -hmm. generally, you know, I guess for myself, I was working in a sort of a nine to five setting. And I thought I was getting a lot done because I had all the side project and hustles I was doing side businesses. And I was like, you know, nine to five. And then I come back afterwards and I do all of this stuff. But then walking from home really helped me understand how much more time I had to do even more stuff and be way more productive. And uh, that has re really led me to not be interested in going back to the office in the traditional setting anymore because I just felt like I was wasting my time sitting in an office because I was not as productive as I should be. 
And I guess this just brings to, to, uh, to me the whole idea of you know, the nine to five life was really from the industrial revolution where uh, you had to you know, stay in an assembly line and you had all this task. And that is really where you know, that nine to five setting life was from. And I feel like it's outdated at this point because nine to five is not really how you get productive. Because uh, working from home for myself, I felt has been just way more productive for myself. Like you mean you work more hours, you get more done in those hours? Yeah, I get more done working from home. What that means is, so for example, my day is very fluid and I like my day to be fluid. For example, from nine to 10, I, I work on project A and then I bounce to project B from like 11 to 12, but I'm very energized because project B is what I really want to do right now. And then when I feel a little tired of project B, I can go to project C or go back to project A. And I feel like throughout my day, I'm just very productive because I'm doing what I really want to do at the moment, not forced to sit in an office and do X, Y, Z, because that's what I've been paid for between nine to five. And I guess maybe entrepreneurs or people who have that sort of mindset would appreciate that more. And I guess some people, no, they just like to have their nine to five and then go home and forget everything, which is fine as well. But I just thought that that has been a very interesting development for myself. And I've lost my nine to five job now. So, you know, uh, I'm sort of living in that world where I'm able to do whatever I want. And I think that's very exciting. It is nerve wracking and, you know, scary a little bit sometimes, but it just opened up the whole possibilities for doing so much more than I anticipated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was cool. Any uh, any final thoughts or advice to uh, you know entrepreneurs, business owners, or people out there before uh, we we call it a day? Um, yeah, I'll share one last thought. This is something I just I was talking about yesterday on my podcast and a couple other places online. So thought it's an interesting thought. I've just kind of been thinking a lot about. It's funny how nothing to do with what we've been talking about, by the way, but it's just an interesting thought. It's funny how you actually never know if a decision is good or bad. Hmm. I don't know if you thought about that. You never actually know because you don't know the alternative, which means that decision making should actually be very easy because there's nothing to analyze. Because no matter how much you analyze, you never actually know. You'll never know if you're right or wrong. Hmm. Like, I'll paint you the following picture: you get this job, you get this job offer, you get two job offers. You're like, oh, which one should I do? Ooh, both are pretty good. Ooh, that one's got this, that one's got that. That's a closer commute. That that. Okay, I'll do part job A. You take job A. You get promoted, you work there, you're super happy. You find a great lady and you actually get married to her, a great, great man, and you actually get married. Like, oh my God, I made such a great decision. It's, thank God, goodness I did that. Wow, I was this close to doing the other job. But man, this is the right, great boss, amazing. And then you're on a plane going to some business meeting and the plane crashes and you died at the age of 32. Well, you made a pretty bad choice of taking that job, but you mm -hmm. couldn't have never known. Right. You couldn't have known, right? And maybe job number two, you made less money, maybe not as good, maybe not the best promotions. You know, you still found a small house married to and you had a great, pretty happy life. And it was okay, but maybe on paper for those four years, it wasn't very good. But then you didn't get on that plane and then you actually lived to the age of 79. Hmm. And then you're at the age of 79. Well, that was actually a better choice for you, wasn't it now? I was thinking about that. I was like, man, so you've got to assume positive intent and or not positive intent. You have to assume everything happens for the better hmm. even though it might not it's just a better way to view it you may as well view it that way because you're not going to know either way if it happened for the better or for the worse you'll never know hmm. and so because you'll never know you may as well assume it happened for the better because you'll never actually know i was curious to me i was like man that's so true that's so funny so decisions are super easy because not like you never know. You just make the best decision you can in the moment. You try to figure it out. You're like, well, I think this is the best decision. And off you go. Hmm. And you don't look back because you'll never know if you're right or wrong. Yeah, I guess it's uh, almost useless trying to think of what if, what if, because, you know, it's kind of almost useless trying to think what yeah. if and it's torturing yourself over there. That's, you. that's an amazing insight. Thanks for sharing yeah. it. I do appreciate it. Last question before I let you go here. Um, how can people contact you? you know, if they're interested in learning about languages, if they want to get in touch with you, maybe to share more insights or learn more insights from yourself, what's the best way to reach you? Um, any social, basically any social network at Polyglot Azrin. So it's P-O-L-Y-G-L-O-T-A-Z or Z, depending on where you're from, R-E-N. Mm -hmm. Um, or, or just uh, my website. So Azarin, A-Z or Z-R-E-N, thelanguagenerd.com. Both mm. are, you'll end, yeah, both are fine. 
Excellent. And I will post that link uh, on the description for this podcast. Thanks, Azrin. It's been a, a huge pleasure chatting with you. So much to learn. Uh, you have such an interesting way of looking at the world that I do appreciate. And uh, thanks again. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on.